Thank you. Is this on? Hello? Engineers. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear? It's okay. Um, I'll be brief because we really would like to have a conversation and perhaps I'll just add to what Bernadine said um, a, a little note about the, the say again um, can you hear or no? okay, they can hear, it's you because um, the sound system's going that way and I just want to add a little note about the rhythm of activism and in a way this could be seen as preaching to the choir because this is a group that's more likely to be activists than most but I think it's important that we speak to each other and talk about what needs to be done and activism is what we need now more than ever there's a wonderful little three line piece in a longer poem by Mary Oliver called instructions for living a life and she says this pay attention be astonished tell about it and to me that's the beginning of a framework to become activists pay attention what that means is we need to open our eyes. We need to see the world as it is. And this isn't something you can do once and then run it on automatic pilot for the rest of your life because the world is too dynamic and so are you. We are all works in progress swimming through a living history. And what we do or don't do not only makes a difference but it changes day to day. So it's not enough to have an idea and think you see the truth because that ends us, ends us up being imprisoned in kind of the the, the, the clear prison of one good idea or the well-lit prison of a good idea rather than being people who can think and act and continue to think and reanalyze. We have to open our eyes again and again. Everything around us is urging us to go to sleep, to anesthetize ourselves. Everything privileged, for example, Bernadine talked about being less than 5% of the world's people and yet consuming enormous amounts of energy and taking up enormous amounts of space in terms of military and, and oil and the wreckage of the environment. But we are only less than 5% of the world's people. But because we enjoy the privileges we enjoy, we can be blind to the unnecessary suffering that we impose on everybody else. It's essential that we wake ourselves up and that we do it again and again and again. The tendency is to go to sleep. Privilege anesthetizes. Yesterday I got on my bicycle on the south side of Chicago and rode downtown on the lake. And I, was rem I, I remarked to myself part way down, wow, it's wonderful, there's no wind. It felt windy that morning, but there was no wind. Until I turned around. When the wind was in my face, then I felt the wind, and then it was much harder to ride. There was no wind when it was behind me because it was helping me. That's the way privilege operates. We don't see it when we benefit from it. We all, the people who see it most clearly are the victims of it and the people who can remind us what it looks like. So we have to pay attention. We have to wake up. We have to see the world as it is and that's an ongoing challenge. We have to be astonished, not only ecstatic at the beauty of everything around us, but horrified at the unnecessary suffering. And it is everywhere. I just got in the, in the mail a, a flyer from the American Friends and it broke down our spending as a country. 60% on militarism and related activities. 60%, 6% on education. And now that we're living in a time of so-called austerity, where are the cuts gonna come? Old people, young people, schools, teachers, nurses, pensions, it's ridiculous. And we have to stand up and speak out against that. That's not only unfair and unjust, it's a guarantee that we have no future worth living. And so we have to fight that. And that's part of what it means to be astonished. Be astonished at the arrogance of power. The arrogance that says that this is the only way we can go. The arrogance that says we're safer in the world because we have 150 military bases scattered around the globe. That we are not safer. Or that we're safer because 2.5 million of our fellow citizens and residents are imprisoned in our country in a massive gulag a massive gulag that's invisible to us if we don't pay attention. So we have to be astonished, and then we have to tell about it, and that means we have to act. We have to do something. We have to stand up and be heard. And for those of you who are activists, it's not enough to take a moral stance and, and kind of feel good about yourself because you have a clear position on the environment, say, or on green jobs. You have to go out and talk to strangers. That's the essence of being an organizer, the essence of being 
a, a citizen in a democracy is that we learn to talk to strangers. And that means every day or every week or every month, you and the people that you agree with and want to be a part of something with, go out and begin the process of knocking on doors or meeting people on the street and trying to persuade them. When I think back to the activism, our activism over the last 40 or 50 years, I guess 50 years, kind of amazing, 50 years. Um, and I think about it, I think in some ways the easiest things that we did were getting arrested and beaten up. The hardest things we did were talking to strangers. Going into Detroit in 1967, knocking on every door and trying to persuade people to oppose the war in Vietnam. That was hard work, it was embarrassing work. Or standing up the American Federation of Teachers Convention and denouncing Hubert Humphrey for being a warmonger in front of 1,500 people, all of whom wanted to shush me and I could hear my mother standing on my shoulder saying, Bill, we don't act that way, and I'm get off my shoulder. Um, you know, it's those kind of things that we have to require ourselves to do. We have to act. And then there's another dimension. We have to doubt. We have to rethink. If all we do is act, we, can, we run the danger of becoming self-righteous and too certain of ourselves. And, and we've made that mistake. If all we do is doubt, we vanish into cynicism. So we have to act and doubt and then open our eyes again, act and doubt again. It seems to me very clear that we cannot be moral people, we cannot be activists, we cannot be good citizens or residents of this country if we don't notice that standing right next to the world as such is a world that could be or a world that should be. It's our responsibility to tease out of the world as such or to imagine or invent a world that could be or should be. Bernadine mentioned closing foreign military bases. I want, to, our, I want to say that we can't be moral people or good activists if we don't exercise our radical imaginations again and again. And that means imagining what it would be like to have no foreign military bases. And you know, the interesting thing is, because we've all seen the movie, we can imagine what the end of the world looks like. But we can't imagine what the end of capitalism looks like. That's ridiculous. Capitalism could be done and we could still live on. Not only the end of capitalism, the end of the war machine. Not only that, the end of prisons. Abolish the prisons. This is something that is within our reach. We could do it, but we, have deci we haven't decided to do it. So the dogma of common sense, the dogma of the way the world is, keeps us in many ways unconfident and trapped in the world as it is. We are trapped in it unless we can imagine beyond it. And part of that imagining is opening up the public square. So our task is to stand up, to be heard, to talk to strangers, to occupy this, that, occupy everything, mostly occupy your imaginations and occupy the future. Thanks very much. So there are people with, people with microphones in the aisles. Your mic is not. So there are two mics, one here, one there, and we would really love you to give a speech or make a statement or ask a question or comment. Right there. Okay. So? Okay, let's just go. Okay. Hello? Hello? Hey. Um, when you're, it, it's easy to talk to the converted. When you're going and talking to strangers, and you're talking to somebody who's opposed to your point of view, can you talk a little bit about how do you, how do you connect with somebody to sway their point of view? Some people are frozen and locked in their point of view. Like, well, we, we need those foreign military bases. We've got to have them, otherwise we're weak or, you know, you know what I mean. Can I you do. talk a little bit about sure. how do you sway without locking them up or freezing them up more? Did you hear that? His question was really, how do you talk to strangers, especially when there's oceans of disagreement, or so it seems? And I, I've had an interesting couple of years because I haven't given, I give talks at universities quite a bit, and I haven't given a talk in the last two years that I haven't been picketed by the Tea Party. And so, the subtitle of my forthcoming book is called I think the Tea Party is picketed. No, they're not here. 
Um, but but it's very common to be picketed by the Tea Party. And the subtitle of my forthcoming book is called Talking with the Tea Party. Because I have found two things. One is, it's easy enough for people like us to see the dogma of the radical right. To see the Republicans in Congress and say, man, those guys don't have a brain in their head. The much harder thing is to see our own dogma. Is to see the ways that we are trapped in a kind of a, a framework of ideas that narrows our ability to think the next thought. And this is where I think, you know what I mean when I say dogma, right? It's like, it's like uh, do you know uh, The Life of Brian, the Monty Python movie? People like you should all know The Life of Brian. If not, go get Netflix. It's about a, it's about a reluctant messiah, and he's standing at one point on a rampart, and he's saying to the people below, I'm not the messiah. And they say, you're not the messiah. And he says, no, no, no. You have minds of your own. And they say, you have, we have minds of our own. And one guy in the crowd says, it's funny, I don't feel like I have a mind of my own. And the rest of the people hit him and say, shut up, you have a mind of your own. Well, that's dogma, and that's the way in which we get trapped. When I talk to the Tea Party, which I do all the time, and they ask me questions, we end up in very funny places having some common ground. So for example, I spoke in Georgia, and uh, one of the Tea Party guys said, you know, I feel like I agreed with a lot of what you said. I was speaking about education. He said, but I'm worried that you're a big government guy. And I said, I'm not. And I said, I'll give you an example. Let's close the Pentagon. And he said, not the Pentagon. And I said, exactly. So you're the big government guy, and I'm actually a small government guy because I want to close the Pentagon. We ended up having a really rich conversation that spilled over into a bar later because I asserted and I believe that all governments, all they do throughout history is tax and spend. So the only thing worth arguing about is tax who and spend on what. Once we move the conversation to there, we actually found some common ground and some difference. He had come up to the speech on a motorcycle and I asked him if he'd driven up on the motorcycle on Interstate 75, a government built socialist highway. And he said he had and he enjoyed it. So, you know, we were having that kind of conversation. We have to embrace the politics of confidence. What I mean by that is on the top 12 issues that I believe in, I'm in the majority in this country. I have to get over the idea that I'm a barricaded little minority under constant attack just because the wealthy and the people who control the airwaves make a lot of noise. I'm not in the minority. Even with all their noise, I'm not in the minority. Secondly, we have to overcome the sense that our ideas are so precious that only we could understand them. Talk to your Republican parents. Go out and talk to your you know, classmates. Go talk to people in the neighborhood and find out where your common ground is. But do it with confidence, not arrogance, not ideology, but with good argument and thoughtful, compassionate approaches. That's my starting point. Can you hear me okay? You can hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, Stand th up. Uh, thank you for um, discussing that exploitation is not a social model for humanity. Um, I mean, I know, you know, we're preaching to the choir here. But um, as New Yorkers, I'd like to just talk a little bit about fracking in New York. Um, and basically, you know, fracking is a, is a big issue for us here today. And um, some of what's happening as far as the economic model goes for fracking is that the companies that are buying the land and buying the leases for, to do the fracking are then reselling those leases to foreign companies. So you have Japanese and Chinese companies who are buying those leases in the same way that America their market struck demanding more resources and there's no the market struck demanding more resources. I think it's necessary for, for there to be laws that protect so much of all 